The title of my lecture is Liberties and Empires, Writing Constitutions in the Atlantic World, 1776 to 1848. And I suppose this talk is essentially about the transcontinental transmission, but also the volatility of certain political texts and devices. Some 50 years ago, the Princeton historian R. R. Palmer published The Age of the Democratic Revolution. Designed as a comparative constitutional history of Western civilization, its two volumes charted the struggles after 1776 over ideas of popular sovereignty and civil and religious freedoms, and the spreading conviction that instead of being confined to privileged, closed, or self-recruiting groups of men, government might be rendered simple, accountable, and broadly based. Understandably, Palmer placed great emphasis on a contagion of substantially new style written constitutions. Between 1776 and 1780, 11 one-time American colonies drafted state constitutions. These went on to inform the provisions of the US Federal Constitution of 1787, which in turn influenced the four revolutionary French constitutions of the 1790s, plus new constitutions in Haiti, Poland, Holland, and elsewhere. By 1820, continental Europe alone had generated at least 50 written constitutions. A further 80 constitutions were drafted between 1820 and 1850, many of them of course in Latin America. The transcontinental spread of written constitutions proved indeed over time almost unstoppable. And Palmer left his readers in no doubt that this was a direct result of the French Revolution of 1789 but still more of the American Revolution of 1776. Despite resistance by entrenched elites, and especially from Britain, which he styled the greatest single champion of the European counter-revolution, a belief was in being by 1800, Palmer argued, that democracy was a matter of concern to the world as a whole, that it was a thing of the future, and that while it was blocked in other countries, the United States should be its refuge. Palmer was writing at a time of Cold War pro-Western and all-American patriotism. But his pioneering transnationalism, together with current interest in the history of democracy, human rights, and liberalism, have given his masterwork a fresh lease of life. In 2010, for instance, David Armitage and Sanjay Subramaniam co-edited an excellent set of essays reappraising the age of revolutions. While in another book on the Declaration of Independence, Armitage has credited the American Revolution with provoking a contagion of sovereignty the revolution's ideas and pioneering written devices, he argues, helped provide for the gradual emergence of a world of states from an earlier world dominated by empires. For Armitage, as for Palmer, 1776 gives rise to forces that have proved unidirectional. The origins of our modern world of nation-states, right Armitage, may be traced back to the American Revolution. Today, I want to propose a more multi-stranded interpretation, both of some of the long-term consequences of 1776 and of the subsequent wave of written constitutions. I can begin doing so by way of another text, a very different text from R. R. Palmer's great work, but one that is connected to some of its themes. This other text 
sits in a glass case in a famous museum. Print reproductions of it have circulated for over 200 years. Scholars have debated its interpretation. Millions of visitors have gazed in awe at the original, rightly viewing it as an iconic emblem of its society of origin. As it happens, I am not referring to the original of the American Constitution, now on show at the National Archives in Washington, but to the Rosetta Stone on display in the British Museum in London. <laughs> An ancient inscribed slab, the Rosetta Stone entered the British Museum's holdings in 1802, some 13 years after the ratification of the US Constitution. Like the latter, the stone was a prize of transcontinental and ideological struggle. A British army had wrested the slab from the French, who in turn discovered and appropriated it during Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1799. Throughout the 19th century, the Rosetta Stone was displayed at the British Museum, Richard Parkinson writes, so as to look like a piece of black and white printed text laid out on an angled reading desk, as if silently ignoring its existence as an ancient monument and subsuming it into the world of Western printing. The Rosetta Stone, I would argue, helps to indicate why a broader, more inquiring analysis into the genesis and spread of the new written constitutions is appropriate. The stone's fate and fortunes are a reminder to begin with that the proliferation of written constitutions after 1776 was part of a wider and markedly <coughs> self-conscious exploitation at this time of language, print, and public texts of all kinds. Both revolutionary and established governments, plus all manner of political, scientific, religious, and cultural actors, exhibited growing interest in the potential of words and signs to persuade and inform and to display and extend power. Anglo-French struggle over the stone also illustrates how this increased ingenuity in regard to text proved a characteristic of empires and not just of emerging nation states. Where and how the Rosetta Stone came ultimately to be manipulated and shown should also prompt us to question the degree to which Britain itself remained aloof from this enhanced culture of public and political writingness. It may appear paradoxical but the spread of new written constitutions after 1776 and its transcontinental repercussions cannot in fact be adequately understood without considering the polity that notoriously still lacks a codified constitution, namely Britain, and without examining the vital role played by matters of empire. Exposure in Britain to these new political texts, as texts, was both precocious and sustained. This was partly due to Britain's sharing a language and certain legal, political and religious ideas with their one-time American colonists. It was also due to Britain's having access to an unparalleled degree by 1776 to advanced printing and publishing networks. As Palmer noted, in France, five collected editions of the American state constitutions were published between 1776 and 1786. In England and Scotland, however, there were at least six editions of these texts in 1782 and 1783 alone. By the 1790s, de Bretz in London, already well known for its compendia of the landed and the titled, 
was selling bound copies of the US Constitution and by now the various French constitutions, as well as learned analyses such as the Commentaries on the Constitution of the United States by James Wilson. Such publications were obviously aimed at the upper end of the reading market, but the new constitutions were also regularly discussed in Britain's cheap and illicit press. In 1820, Richard Carlyle devoted six successive issues of his newspaper, The Republican, to a line-by-line -line analysis of the recently reintroduced Spanish constitution, drawing attention to its generous franchise provisions and its rejection of a hereditary upper house. As late as 1836, Carlyle was staging celebrations in London of the anniversary of Spain's 1812 constitution, attracting what was described as the poorest of the working class and reading out to anyone who would listen an outline of a new constitution such as should be submitted to the British nation. Ideas about constitutions also evolved and circulated in Britain by way of word of mouth and personal exchange. Throughout the 19th century, as after, London attracted sizable numbers of political refugees, many of whom were advocates of advanced political change. London was peopled with exiles of every kind and every country, wrote an Italian dissident in 1823. Constitutionalists who would have but one chamber, constitutionalists who wished for two, constitutionalists after the French model, after the Spanish, the American. London was the Elysium, a satirist would say the botany bay of illustrious men and would-be heroes. As this suggests, those making London a city of political exiles came from many backgrounds. But immediately before and after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, a disproportionate number of these exiles were Hispanic. Many liberals who left Spain after Ferdinand VII returned to Madrid in 1814 sought refuge in London, while over 70, 70 South American independence era leaders of the first rank, plus many lesser figures, lived in London at some point between 1808 and 1830. There was the great precursor of Spanish American independence. Francisco de Miranda, who spent most of the first decade of the 19th century in London and who referred to its house in Grafton Street there as the fixed point for the independence and liberties of the Colombian continent. There was Bernardo O'Higgins, the Chilean independence leader, who was part Irish and had been educated in England. There was Lucas Alaman, a future Mexican minister and a leading reformer and conservative theorist. Jose de San Martin, who would pay tribute to the title of the 17th century English revolutionary Oliver Cromwell by declaring himself protector of Peru. And the grand liberator himself, Simon Bolivar, who first visited Britain in 1810 and liked to cite it as his primary foreign political influence. The question of how far exposure to Britain influenced the politics of these and other Latin American activists has been widely canvassed. It is clear that most of these men took ideas and strategies from various transatlantic sources, but it is also clear that R. R. Palmer's contention that 1776, quote, dethroned England and set up America as a model for those seeking a better world was much too sweeping. Especially in the 1820s and 30s, the need to restore stability to newly independent states in Latin America 
made many of its resident and exiled political actors eager to scrutinize British forms of government, still viewed, flatteringly enough, as an exemplary compound of liberty and order. This was true, for instance, of the writers of the Chilean Constitution of 1833. Abandoning earlier federal projects borrowed from the United States, they drafted a new constitution providing for a strong executive, a lower house with the power to approve taxation and the armed forces on an annual basis after the English pattern, and an upper house representing the property classes. This 1833 Chilean constitution <laughs> lasted almost unaltered for over 60 years. How far the presence of continental European and Latin American constitutional reformers, plus extensive coverage of the new constitutions in the British and Irish press, and the import and translation of important foreign texts, affected political ideas within the United Kingdom itself, has been much less explored. The tendency, here as elsewhere, in Britain as elsewhere, for political history to be reconstructed overwhelmingly within national frameworks has militated against such inquiries. So has the notion that Britain has been straightforwardly wedded, at least from the mid-17th century, to an unwritten constitution. This despite the fact that this phrase, unwritten constitution, only became firmly embedded in British political self-description from the 1870s. <coughs> Historians in Britain are rarely trained to think or pose questions about written constitutions as political and cultural instruments and influences while commentators from other countries tend not to associate written constitutions with Britain or the British at all. Yet evidence of the post-1776 surge of constitutions impacting on radicals and reformers within Britain, and not just on radicals there, is abundant. Consider a man called John Cartwright, Major Cartwright, as he was usually known. An Englishman who was involved in radical organizing and writing from before the American Revolution to his death in 1824. Cartwright is normally discussed only with regard to an insular tradition of parliamentary reform. Yet from early on, he identified and adopted what is still one of the strongest arguments for a political constitution being set down in a single recognized text, namely that this has the potential of making the workings of a state rather better known. A constitution of which not the most learned man can know where to find all its parts, and of which not the most capacious understanding can embrace the whole, what ordinary man shall pretend to scan? Here then is as complete a labyrinth for bewildering men's senses as the most subtle adversary of freedom can wish for. Since he viewed political participation and knowledge as the birthright of all adult males, though only males, Britain's ever varying chameleon constitution as he described it, was anathema to Cartwright. Beacons and landmarks were necessary, he wrote, a politics accessible to every eye. Proposals for a written British constitution, he argued, should be printed, circulated, and submitted to three years national discussion. Once agreed on, he wanted the provisions of this new constitution to be inscribed in gold on the interiors of Parliament, just as the Ten Commandments were displayed in churches as guides and rebukes to worshippers. 
Copies of this new British constitution, he thought, should also be mass produced and circulated so as to become a piece of sacred furniture in every household. As the content and choice of language of some of these proposals indicate, Cartwright borrowed from both revolutionary France and the new <coughs> United States. He also had extensive dealings with Hispanic activists, frequently forging connections with such men when they were in London and employing Hispanic exiles as conduits to reach audiences in Spain and South America. Um, he also had many Portuguese uh, correspondents and allies in London. Thus, after the Dr. Mayo uprising in 1808, Cartwright began writing to politicians and friends in Spain, urging that the crisis be seized on to remodel the state. Areas of Spain breaking free of French control, he urged, should reunite with Portugal as the Commonwealth of the Iberian States. Thought should be given to a new constitution setting out the grand essentials of free government, a bicameral legislature and an elected regent who should be over 30 years of age and serve for only five years. Provisions that were clearly modelled on the US Constitution's rule for the presidency, but were more rigorous. The whole secret, Cartwright wrote to a Spanish liberal some years later, consists in the laws being made and administered by the people. There were other Cartwright constitutional initiatives, including a provisional constitution for Greece, sent to its newly established Congress in 1822, and a constitutional instrument for Mexico the following year, which was discussed by that country's Committee of Constitutions. The more Cartwright aged, the more ingenious his constitutional projects became. He advised Greek independence fighters to reproduce lines from the constitution he was designing for them on the surface of their copper coins, thus rendering money a circulating medium of constitutional knowledge. Knowledge is power. Cartwright's brand of internationalism helps account for his close working relationship with Jeremy Bentham, another far better known London-based writers of constitution constitutions. At different stages of his career, Bentham sketched out a constitution for France, a new legal code for the United States, and a constitutional code for Poland. He produced a commentary on a new Portuguese constitution, a revision of Spain's legal code, a draft of a constitutional code for Greece, and a constitution for Tripoli the first serious attempt by a Western actor to explore how the new constitutional politics might be applied to an Islamic society. Above all, Bentham devoted attention to Latin America, a continent to which he twice considered emigrating. During the 1820s, he set out constitutional proposals for Buenos Aires, <coughs> Guatemala and Venezuela, and he designed a mammoth constitution for Colombia containing 191 articles. <coughs> Bentham, I should say, wrote 14 double pages every night. A lesson to us all. These, these schemes, of which at least a few had some practical impact, are reasonably well known. But Bentham's evident confidence that individuals from one country could pronounce authoritatively on the constitutional reordering of another country merits far more scrutiny. Although sometimes critical of the European empires and increasingly negative about Britain's own politics, Bentham seems instinctively to have accepted, as John Cartwright also tended to do, 
that Anglo-Saxons on both sides of the Atlantic might well possess a superior capacity for rule. This emerges in the conviction that Bentham sometimes shared with his disciple James Mill that even authoritarian British rule in the Indian subcontinent might be an improvement on indigenous governance there. It emerges too in Bentham's dealings with Aaron Burr, one time Vice President of the United States, in regard to the latter's schemes to make himself Emperor of Mexico. Burr told me I should be the legislator, Bentham recorded proudly, and he would send a ship of war for me. He said the Mexicans would all follow like a flock of sheep. This belief that men with English-bred minds, as Bentham styled it, were better equipped for inventing and implementing systems of rule also informed his proposals in 1822 for a proto-Panama-type canal. He envisaged this as being funded by British investors and constructed on land ceded by what was then Mexico to what he called the Anglo-American United States. The US government, he wrote, was an institution which has long been in the habit of taking an infant state to nurse. Witness Indiana, Illinois, Alabama, Missouri, and how excellent a dry nurse the US president has always been. By contrast, he thought, the Hispanic and indigenous inhabitants of Central America were not as yet of sufficient age to go alone. Such notions of an innate Anglo-American capacity to reorganize others for their own good would have a long history. As Benson's projects illustrate, enthusiasm for devising new constitutions as engines of improvement and freedom sometimes merged among advanced radicals, but also among other political actors, with an ambition to manage, control, and even invade. That this might be the case formed part, indeed, from Edmund Burke's reflections onwards of the conservative critique of the new constitutionalism. Consider, in this regard, the voyage of Captain Pompanilla, an early and very Burkean novel published in 1828 by Benjamin Disraeli, a future British Conservative Prime Minister and a deeply unsuccessful speculator in Mexican mining. The eponymous hero of Disraeli's novel is a native of an island in the Indian Ocean, who stumbles upon a shipwrecked cargo of useful knowledge. Through reading these improving water-stained volumes, Pompanilla learns to speak, writes Disraeli with heavy irony, in sentences which would not have disgraced the mellifluous pen of Bentham. From here, Pompanilla advances to a little badinage on the Bill of Rights and flew off to an airy aperçu of the French Revolution. Banished from his home island on account of his overzealous enthusiasm for advanced views, Pompanilla ends up on a very different island, a society that views itself as the saviour and champion of civil and religious liberty in all quarters of the globe, and that seeks to impose constitutional bliss on others. A whole corps diplomatique and another ship full of abstract philosophers were immediately ordered off to the West, and shortly after to render their first principles still more effective, and their administrative arrangements still more influential. Some brigades of infantry and a detachment of guards followed 
Free constitutions are apt to be misunderstood until half of the nation are bayoneted and the rest imprisoned. I believe, remarks a character towards the end of the novel, that we call it the colonial system. This mode of conservative polemic, that the new written constitutions, far from simply circumscribing power, could aid the extension of power domestically and beyond, drew power from the fact that those regimes which were most conspicuously associated with the onset of new constitutions, <laughs> France and the United States, were also markedly expansionist powers. As Stuart Wolfe has analysed, written constitutions formed an integral part of Napoleon's perception of how to lay foundations for effective and durable imperial control within Europe. Sometimes, as in the case of the Westphalia Constitution in 1807, Napoleon deployed these instruments to create new client states. But as with the constitution for the Duchy of Warsaw, which he personally drafted that same year, 1807, Napoleon also used these devices to remodel existing states in accordance with his strategic and ideological objectives. The imperial and managerial potential of written constitutions was also in evidence on the other side of the Atlantic. Many factors helped to drive American expansionism after independence, but it was undoubtedly facilitated by new constitutions. As Max Edling and others have demonstrated, the federal constitution of 1787 was designed in some respects, in some respects, to strengthen the authority and reach of the central government. One of the American founders' initiatives, for instance, was to ensure that treaties approved in Washington became the law of the land, binding on just judges in every state. <coughs> It was partly by means of adroit, centrally devised and centrally implemented treaties with Native Americans and with the old European empires that the United States was able to triple in size between 1783 and 1850. Moreover, and as Michael Mann has analyzed in his chilling The Dark Side of Democracy, the Jeffersonian vision of we, the people, proved at once egalitarian and democratic in some of its tendencies and simultaneously often ethnically exclusive. The more the settler democracy, the more the ethnic exclusivity. Growing numbers of white settlers moving westwards and southwards through the American continent were encouraged to draft their own state constitutions which interlocked with the federal constitution and which usually excluded Native Americans and blacks as well as females from full citizenship. By so ordering, Washington put in place a powerfully effective set of mechanisms whereby the new American Republic became able to consolidate and represent and envisage itself as a continent-wide nation while simultaneously implementing overland empire. To acknowledge this is in no way to deny and I stress this, the revolutionary potential of the new constitutions or their massive contributions in many places to widening rights and political participation. But it is to suggest that accounts of these devices and their spread have sometimes been overly triumphalist 
and teleological and too narrowly formulated. Uh, I think they're too bound up with a teleology of uh, the democratic nation state and its rise. Uh, and one has to take a wider view. By their very nature, written constitutions wear and are ambivalent, volatile documents. As well as widening rights, they could and can discriminate against the illiterate and the semi-literate. Unless available in multiple translations, written constitutions could and can disadvantage a state's minority linguistic groupings. In other ways too, written constitutions over time have defined citizenship in such a way as to marginalize and exclude elements of a population and not simply and invariably to liberate. Yet although an immense amount of work has been undertaken in recent decades on how writing, print and texts can be employed as tools of power, this more searching and skeptical scholarship has had limited impact on the study of written constitutions. This is doubly strange given that many prominent early exponents of written constitutions also displayed an interest in language and its uses more broadly. Thus Thomas Jefferson favoured the study of Native American languages but only for antiquarian purposes. While Andres Bayo, another Hispanic exile in London and the writer of Chile's civil code and possibly of sections of its 1833 constitution, also wrote a short essay on the origin and progress of the art of writing. The transcontinental spread of political constitutions after 1776 thus needs situating, I believe, in broader and more diverse textual contexts. It can profitably be examined, for instance, alongside the contemporaneous surge of missionary activity on both sides of the Atlantic with its accompanying much wider distribution of Bibles and other religious texts. The new written constitutionalism also needs examining in relation to the proliferation from the mid-18th century onwards of new grammar books and dictionaries, texts that were designed again at once to inform and to improve and to regulate and set bounds. Only think of the wording of Samuel Johnson's proposal in 1747 for his new English dictionary. In this, Johnson compared himself to the soldiers of Caesar and expressed the hope that while he might not complete the conquest in writing his dictionary, I shall at least discover the coast, civilised part of the inhabitants, and make it easy for some other adventurer to proceed farther and to reduce them wholly to subjection and settle them under laws. Here, as some philosophers of language in the mid-18th century acknowledged, was a heightened awareness of the potential of language and texts to mould and to manage and to organise. And you can see this not in merely in the works of private writers and philosophers, but in the acts of polities as well. Consider this year, 1787. 1787, as we see, as we have seen, sees the drafting of the new US written constitution, but it sees other things too. 1787 is also the year when 
His Majesty's Stationery Office is established in London, the first ever centralized unit to preside over the distribution of government print in Great Britain. 1787 also, interestingly, sees the completion in Beijing of what is called the Comprehensive Treatises of our August Dynasty, the great master work on Qing linguistics. The Comprehensive Treatise was designed for administrative and religious purposes, but it was also an expression of Qing imperial ideology enabling the Chinese imperial government to boast that scholars in its employ had developed analytical tools to get to the very core of language. And the idea behind the comprehensive treatise was that this would not only help the Chinese emperor cement his existing empire, but it would also allow that empire to grow. It would facilitate, it was declared, the flourishing of harmonious cultures. And just as the roots of and influences on the new written constitutions were plural and mixed in this way, so was their uses. It was soon recognized, for instance, that written constitutions could cater to monarchical regimes and not just republics. In 1811, Henri Christophe, a one-time slave and black revolutionary, employed a new constitution in order to proclaim himself hereditary king of Haiti and to establish a nominated aristocracy. More established monarchies also learned how to employ the new constitutional devices. In the 1830s, Prints were being distributed in Portugal, displaying richly dressed members of its royal family, clustering around and proudly holding a copy of the country's written constitution. The degree to which the new constitutions possessed multiple roots and multiple applications helps explain why reactions to them in Britain at all levels and not just among radicals proved nuanced, shifting and often adaptive. Official British responses to revolutionary French constitution making were to be sure negative. Yet the virulence of what R.R. Palmer styled Britain's counter-revolution should not obscure the degree to which this country was itself swept along after 1776 by a wider, more writing-based politics. Thus, in 1803, the House of Commons began allocating seats to journalists so that for the first time, verbatim accounts of its debates could be published in the newspaper press. The onset of new constitutions abroad also fostered a more intensive and modified cult in Britain of Magna Carta. The number of parliamentary allusions to Magna Carta made and recorded between 1776 and 1800 is 20 times higher, 20 times higher than the total number of such references recorded between 1760 and 1775. At both elite and non-elite levels, there was an increased tendency after 1776 in Britain to represent Magna Carta as a kind of pioneering written constitution, our constitution, as one British minister called it in 1808. Reimagining and repositioning Magna Carta in this fashion served at one level to buttress conservative arguments that Britain had no need of a new paper constitution because it already possessed the first such foundational 
an exemplary text. Um, and this becomes a really strong 19th century argument, and it's not just pushed by the British. Uh, if you look at collected editions of written constitutions in the first two thirds of the 19th century, they often include Magna Carta. Magna Carta becomes an honorary first written constitution. Yet the fact that Britain possessed ancient venerated constitutional texts of its own could also work to ease acceptance of the new style written constitutions in more adventurous ways. The degree to which even sections of Britain's elite had partially internalized the new vogue for constitutional writingness emerges in the parliamentary debates leading up to the British Reform Act of 1832. Both opponents and supporters of this repeatedly referred to it as a new constitution. That phrase is constantly used. He should suppose the Reform Bill a sheet of white paper, accused one parliamentary opponent, on which the government thought proper to place a new constitution. Yet what was striking about these kind of critiques levelled at the Reform Bill was that their impact proved limited. Persons were somewhat startled when the words new constitution first met their ears, noticed another British MP in 1831. But now the expression was received and used without hesitation. It was only later in the 19th century, from about 1870, that British commentators became more unvaryingly and explicitly insistent on the quintessential non-writingness of their constitution. And there's a marked verbal shift which one can now trace uh, on computers. Partial British accommodation to the new constitutionalism was also eased by considerations of global prestige and intervention. A desire to ensure continuing respect for their own political system meant that far from straightforwardly othering the new constitutionalism, Britain's governing elite sought instead selectively to exploit and endorse it. At one level, this involved expressing approval and sometimes actively assisted those foreign written constitutions that embodied or that could be represented as embodying aspects of Britain's own system of government. Thus, after Bolivar drafted a constitution in 1826 for the South American Republic bearing his name, the immediate reaction of the British consul at Lima was one of national self-congratulation. The new Bolivian constitution, he wrote, was founded apparently on the basis of the British constitution, allowing useful liberty but obviating any mischievous excess of popular power. In much the same way, the Statuto of Piedmont Sardinia one of the few 1848 written constitutions to endure was widely celebrated in Britain, even by conservatives, on the grounds that it incorporated political institutions most nearly resembling our own. Increasingly, indeed, the new constitutionalism was viewed as posing challenges to which it was necessary that Britain's official classes respond in some way. An obvious way was for the British themselves to attempt writing constitutions, but in their own style. And attempts to do this began very early. In 1780, the British cabinet drafted a charter for groups of American loyalists which was designed to parry the idea of the American revolutionaries and serve as a blueprint for a new American constitution in the event of imperial victory. British and British-supported actors 
also tried their hands at drafting constitutions during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, especially in the Mediterranean region, in Corsica, in Sicily, in the Ionian Islands. Some of these British uh, Revolutionary and Napoleonic War written constitutions are quite radical, like the one in Corsica. Some are extremely conservative, like the one in the Ionian Islands. But even looking at that one, you see how caught up the British are, in fact, in change. Uh, the title they give to their written constitution for the Ionian Islands is a constitution for the United States of the Ionian Islands. Um, a wonderful example of how the British are caught up in the age of revolutions, even as they seek to control and oppose it. As we have seen, written constitutions have often, among many other things, served managerial and expansionist purposes. So it was scarcely surprising that some British actors were eager to experiment with them in regions of overseas influence and imperial effort. British attempts to use written constitutions to ease power and influence overseas would indeed continue until the end of the 20th century and are not over yet. But let me end today with an episode in British constitution writing that brings together many of the points I have been trying to advance. <laughs> As Miles Taylor has shown, the idea that Britain remained immune to the multiple revolutions of 1848 is only partially correct. They remained immune to it within Britain, but they did not remain immune to it in their empire. After 1848, Taylor writes, constitutional change was hurried through in virtually all British colonies. By the mid-1850s, most colonial constitutions bore little resemblance to what had existed before 1848. In regard to the settlement colonies, colonial reformers in Britain had started agitating for new constitutions even before 1848. They did so in part under the influence of Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, which was translated into English soon after its publication in 1835. <laughs> Growing interest in devising constitutional texts for the settlement colonies was also fostered by developments in the United States. Over the course of the 1840s, US expansion reached the Pacific. Both the scale now of America's overland empire and Washington's success in threading this continent-wide construct together by a network of written constitutions encourage colonial reformers in Britain to argue that its own settlement empire in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, in South Africa also required new written constitutions if it was to cohere and endure. As this again underlines, Britain was ineluctably caught up in post-1776 transatlantic trends of new constitution making that spread and flourished in part, in part, because they catered not simply to nation making and rights, but also to imperial projects of different kinds. But there were risks. Always, always, written constitutions were mixed and volatile instruments. When in the late 1840s and early 1850s, London dispatched new constitutions to the Australian colonies, it provoked a storm. Groups of white settler activists successfully agitated for greater degrees of democracy and local autonomy 
than London had wanted, though reserving it strictly for whites. One of the leading Australian activists involved was a John Dunmore Lang, a Scots Presbyterian minister. Lang exemplifies how wide and how intricate the Atlantic world of constitutional politics could be. His mother had been radicalised by listening to a sermon in Scotland given by John Witherspoon, one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence. Lang himself travelled extensively in the United States and Europe, and both regions shaped his political ideas. One of his pet schemes, for instance, was to set up a colony on a Pacific island and settle it with German political refugees from the 1848 revolutions. Like many other individuals in the 19th century, Lang also devoted time to drafting his own amateur written constitutions. But this is something I think has been generally forgotten. We look at the great official written constitutions, but throughout the long 19th century, writing your own constitution is one of the things that many gentlemen scholars, uh, political activists, would-be political activists do. And these texts are wonderful, um, partly because they show how fluid politics is still seen as being. We, we think of the federal constitution in the United States, there are scores of attempted new written constitutions drafted by American individuals in the 19th century who want a different kind of America. Lang is one of these 19th century activists in Australia who drafts his own constitutions. There's many of them. Um, and in, in many ways, they're very radical documents. He wanted Australia to become an independent, democratic republic, just like the United States, which he admired enormously. And this is the land that is much admired and celebrated by Australian Republicans today. Um, but they tend to gloss over the rest of land's constitutional ideas. Because yes, he wanted a democratic Australian Republic, but he also wanted this Australian Democratic Republic to go on to annex Fiji, the New Hebrides, and New Guinea, while he wanted its white inhabitants to at least endeavour to raise the Aborigines to their own higher level. The city of Sydney dreamed land as he penned one of his written constitutions, would in time become the permanent headquarters of the future Australian Empire. Thank you.